Okay. Um, welcome. Um, good morning, everyone. This is this uh, second class in this um, lecture. Um, today we're talking about regression. Um, as you see, we're um, videotaping this, so um, I hope we have uh, later then some references that you can use for your preparation for the exam. Um, I'll try to do my best to make everything so that you can see it later in the in the uh, recording. Um, <coughs> so um, regression is a very important problem, and um, we uh, had in the first lesson we had these um, subdivisions of different machine learning techniques. And the first thing we do is uh, kind of um, orient ourselves where we are, where is regression located, what does regression actually mean, and then we go uh, into more details. How can uh, can how can we do regression, and what are the um, different um, or what are possible uh, solutions to the regression problem? So first of all, um, we have these categories of learning again. Yeah, we know that um, we say that uh, regression is a is a supervised learning problem. Um, that means we have some um, labeled data, right? So we have some some da training data set that was uh, labeled by some human, um, and we do in the first round we do some training on that data set, and in the second round we get some new test data which is unobserved. And on that test data, we do inference, right? This is what we call inference. Inference, you can also say prediction, right? You say you have a new uh, test data set, and you would like to know, um, you'd like to assign it some kind of semantics. Um, and the way they do this is by first having trained a model on the, on the learning, on a training data set, and then use that model and apply it to the test data set. So we had this already um, also last week, so, or two weeks ago, actually. And um, so we have, again, these um, subdivisions of supervised learning techniques. And these hold the same for regression. So regression is same, is, uh, can also be sub subdivided in any of, any of these here. Um, first of all, we need, again, some math. right? We need to get some formulation uh, that explains a bit more what the pr uh, problem means and what we have with, uh, in, in regression here. So first of all, we have, again, our two sets. right? We have a set of objects and a set of categories. Right. This can be classes in the classification sense, and now we're doing regression, so this is not uh, a class. Right. This is just a value, just some kind of uh, numbers. And we have this mapping here. So phi is a mapping from objects to um, categories or to some uh, target um, point here. So this is a very, very general formulation. Right. It can be anything. I said this already last time that. Uh, we don't know what objects actually are. We don't know what, what how, how we describe this. I, I think it's more it's easier to understand this as as being a feature vector, right? As being something that we can extract from data, something that we can compute. And this is something we don't know, right? This is something that may be a semantics, that may be um, a value, that may be something that we would like to have. And what we do now is find parameters for a mapping that maps from x to y. And the only difference between classification and regression is that this y in regression is just uh, an arbitrary set. It can be the real numbers. Usually, it's the real numbers. And in classification, this is a discrete set. Right? This is a discrete set of labels. Right? So I, I assign every input uh, data point, I assign a class label. And this class label is just an integer number. It can be either uh, mi m uh, 1 or minus 1 for binary classification, or 1 or 0 for binary classification, or it can be a class label. But here we have just uh, a, um, so we say that y is continuous. If, th if y is continuous, then we have regression. And, um, and we learn a function that, um, that maps from, from here to here. So for now, we will for, for this lesson today, we treat uh, the topic of regression. Um, and then there's an another important topic uh, or notion, which is called the basis function. So First of all, we can say these, as I said already, these, these objects here, the elements in X, they can be anything, right? Real numbers, graphs, objects, any kind of things. But usually what we do is we first we extract some features and we do some pre-processing step. And um, we can do this by so-called basis functions. So we have a map from X to some other space, right? And this map is called phi. Phi is our basis function. So we extract some features, for example, and these features are then used um, for regression. You can also see it differently. You can also see if, if x are already values in R, right? If we already uh, are already given some good values here, then we can uh, interpret phi 
um, as a basis function, as a mapping into a different space. And in that different space, um, regression is better, easier. So this is, again, a very general dis um, uh, definition, but it helps us later to uh, describe very like many problems, right? many different kinds of problems in the same um, framework. OK, so now we can also interpret these basis functions as, uh, uh, as features that I said already. And um, yeah, and, and for example, this is just an example. We have uh, width and height of objects, so these, these kind of things. Um, Example. So let's let's start with a very simple example. Um, here we have a problem. We have some data points here. These are in red, and um, we have our input data is just the real axis. So we have some values here on this real axis, and our output data is this is defined now. We say this should be a continuous set. So we have uh, this as an output set, right? So uh, and and the problem now is we'd like to find a mapping from this x to the y space. Right, given our data, right, and this model that we would like to find should explain our data in a very like in the best way, and we have to decide what is best, right? How how can we decide, or how can we say how what is a good mapping here? So <coughs> the first thing we can do is uh, let's say we have these data points here x1, t1, t1. It's called t1 because it's it's a particular t. We could also have actually y here. So I, I use a notation from uh, the bishop. Uh, it's sometimes not consistent, so some other people just use y's here, so um, yeah. For now, I, I try to be consistent and name it all with t's. Um, okay, now <coughs> you have this mapping here, and we, for now we assume that we have already some kind of model. We know a parametric formulation of that problem, right? And this is a very simple one, which is just a line, right? We just say the mapping from x to y is nothing else than the line. And what we don't know are the parameters of that line. w0 and w1 are the values that we don't know. And what we want to have is some w star, which is the optimal parameter set that fits our line into that data. Now, um, to do that, we need, first of all, some kind of objective function. We need something that we can optimize on. And we do this using a, an error function, right? We say, this is our model, and this is our, what the data looks like. So the ti's are given from the data, and the, the xi's are given also from the data. And what we don't have is w, we just map now xi using w into our space, into our space y, and then take just the squared distance to our data, right? To the actual data that we actually observed. And we sum this up and divide it by two, and then we have the so-called sum of squared errors. And now the idea is to use, uh, to, mi to minimize this function. And we can do this by taking the gradient of it, right? So we derive it. This is here, derivative of this, and we set it to zero. And note this is a vector here because we have two, um, two parameters, w has two parameters, and we derive this vector with respect to both parameters, and we get this row vector here, right? It's important to get a row vector because later, later things are easier to use or it's, it's better to use row vectors here. We could also uh, formulate everything with column vectors. So this is the idea. Now, <coughs> how to do that? First of all, we know that our model here, this is our model, right, again, our linear equation. If we take the, the gradient of this, which appears here, right, we have this is the inner derivative of our, of our uh, whole um, thing. Um, the inner derivative is, can be written as another vector, right? This is just uh, the constant, and this is derivative of, uh, with respect to the second parameter, is just xi, right? This is just deriving our, of our linear equation with respect to w0 and w1 and write it as a row vector. Okay, now uh, we use another vector notation. We say um, xi, we can, explain, we can write this thing as an x vector, right? We say, okay, we define xi to be exactly that vector. And then it turns out that our model here can be written in a vector form uh, uh, way, right? We now have a vector w, which is just w0, w1. And we do a dot product of that w vector with our x vector, right? This is just a, a more compact way of writing this here. And you can already see this is much easier to write because if we have many more parameters in our model, right? Now we have only two, but very often we have many more parameters. Then it's, of course, tedious to write them all down. So what we can do is we just write it like, like this here with long vector and another long vector. And then we have just a, a, a nice dot product here. Okay, now let's plug this all, all together and see what happens. 
Um, we have now our, our gradient here. This is the gradient function. Now we uh, write this all in, in, in vector form. So we plug this in here, here, right? This is goes in here. So we have wt times xi. Uh, on the right side, we have this thing here, which is exactly here just uh, as, a, as a column vector, right? So we have to write this as a column vector. Uh, that means we have this thing. And what we also have, we have like two terms in the sum, and we just pull them out to, to get two sums, right? This one sum here goes first for this term and then for, for this other term, which we have to again multiply with this thing here. So we multiply it again with xi transpose, and the ti goes here, and the whole thing should be zero, right? This is our, our objective. We would like to have this very small, or basically zero. And what this means is that um, if we now sum up sum this on both sides, then this should be our equality, right? Also, what is interesting here, the w can be pulled out because it's, it's, it doesn't count, right? It's, it's independent of these i's. So what we have here is we have a sum of matrices here. These are matrices. This is important to, to note, right? Because xi is a, is, a, is a row vector and xit is a column vector. That means he, this here are uh, matrices. And it's n matrices, so we sum up n matrices. And here we sum up n vectors. So we have a matrix times a vector equals a vector. And um, we name these vectors. We say this is matrix A, this is matrix B, and it's now all written in transpose form, right? So uh, now we can, of course, easily transpose everything and then say this is the same as saying A times B equals uh, A times W equals B, which means that we have a very simple linear equation. We simply have to solve this problem. We invert A, and that's it. But well. If this possible, if it's not possible, then we have to do other things, and we'll see this later. Now, <coughs> this is uh, the simple problem, the simple part of the problem. Let's make it a little bit more complicated, and let's now assume that we have some phi function here. Before we could say that our basis function phi were just the identity, right? Every x was just mapped to x to, to itself. Now we have um, basis functions uh, that are polynomials. Or basically, it's, it's actually monomials, right? So this, in the end, the whole sum will be the polynomial, but this every basis function is a monomial. Um, that means that the jth basis function is just x to the power of j. Um, and we'll see that now we can explain, we can express many more things. We can use that to um, for much better, finer uh, models, right? So for, uh, now uh, we don't have a line anymore. We don't have the restriction to fit a line into the data. Now we can fit any kind of model into that data if our if the complexity of our model is is big enough and that is already something i would like to uh, point out so we have two parameters here or two important numbers one is the data set size which is n the number of data points and the other one is m which is the so-called model complexity this is the the number of basis functions that we assume that are given right we say our complexity is not higher than that we say this is the number of, of basis functions that we allow okay so, <coughs> and now if we, if we say that, then uh, we do the same thing again as before, right? The equation should be mostly the same, just with this little difference here that we have now phi in here, right? How does it look like? Uh, now we have this thing here, right? We have a, a very long vector, which is of length m. It starts with 1, and it has all these spaces functions here, and we just write this again very conveniently. We write this as a vector, so we have a big vector of basis functions. So, and our model now can be, can be written like this now. So we have w, which is again as, lo as long as we have parameters, of course, right? This is what we actually want to have, these w values. And we ha have as many w's as we have phi's, of course, right? Because for every basis function, we have a, a parameter, a, a, weight, a weight function, a weight uh, value. Now, the this thing is the same as before, right? This is the same equation. We have our error, error function here. We'd like to minimize this error by simply, um, yeah, uh, taking the square of the dis distance to our, to our actual data. And we do now again the, the gradient as before. And now the only difference from the equation from before is that here, instead of xi, xit, we have uh, phi of xi times phi of xit, right? These are just uh, now different vectors here. And here's another thing uh, again, right? We have these phi's here. Um, and uh, now to understand what happens here and to even write it more compact, uh, we need to a little bit understand what this what this means is. So say, okay, this is again an outer product, um, and I try to make this here graphically so that it really makes that is really clear what this actually means. So we have here a row vector which is this phi one 
transpose, right? Phi itself is a, is a column vector. This is defined as a column vector here. But the transpose, like here, is, of course, a row vector. So we have, we have this row vector. We have uh, itself we, uh, multiplied with itself uh, as, a, as a column vector. And this is just uh, the outer product of phi uh, with itself, right? Now, we don't have this only once. We have this n times. That means we have another term, right? Phi 2 and so on and so on. And so we sum up all these uh, order products, and what happens now is this, right? If we sum this up, then uh, we have uh, all the phi vectors in one side and the phi rows on the other, uh, on, on this side. So in the end, what this means is we can write this down as one big matrix um, multiplication, right? Where we just stack all the column vectors on one side, we stack all the row vectors on the other side, and this is just exactly the same. This is just the same mathematical operation than summing over all these kind of things, right? It's a very nice trick, um, but that leaves us with uh, a simple matrix operation, right? We just have now phi t times phi. We define this as being phi the big matrix phi t, which is different from this phi, right? This is a vector and this is a matrix. Yeah? Um, and what happens now is we have this, right? So you can explain this, uh, write this as a, as a uh, matrix uh, multiplication, and we define our matrix to be like this here, right? This is the matrix of basis functions. We have every row uh, is, is a basis function for, for a given uh, data point, and we have as many rows as we have data points, right? N by M, right? It's not doesn't have to be a square matrix, right? It's that's important to know. It's not square. It's as many uh, data points as we have. Uh, is the data points give the give the rows, and the complexity of the model, which is the uh, number of parameters that we have, are the columns. And now, of course, we think r can write things very easily, right? We have this nice equation now here, and um, this is called uh, the uh, normal equation, right? So we now so we say again, this should be zero. So we put this on the other side and say, these are our normal equations now. Now we have this formulation. And to solve it, what we have to do is we, com we uh, take, we multiply on both sides with the ins inverse of phi t phi, which is this here. And, and now we have to solve our problem. And this whole matrix here, phi t, uh, t phi transpose times, times phi inverse times uh, phi transpose is called the pseudo inverse. Right, so we write this as a with a plus. We say phi plus is the same as this here. Right, this is the solution to our problem. Now, some words about the pseudo inverse. Um, mathematically, a pseudo inverse always exists for every matrix. It doesn't matter which matrix you have; it's always you can always compute them as pseudo inverse. Which is not true for, uh, of course, for the standard uh, inverse, right? For the normal inverse. This is nice, so we don't have to care about this, right? However. If phi is very close to singular, if we have like yeah, an almost non-singular matrix, then the solution is numerically unstable, right? Then, then computing the pseudo inverse is sometimes numerically not so easy. Therefore, what we can do is to compute the pseudo inverse, we take the so-called singular value decomposition, the SVD. And the SVD is defined as, as this here. We have a matrix phi, and we decompose that matrix into three other matrices, U, D, and VT where U and V are orthogonal matrices. I hope everyone knows what an orth orthogonal matrix is. Uh, if not, I can quickly say. So if um, orthogonal matrices are simply matrices that if you multiply them with their own transpose, then you have the identity. So U times U transpose is always the identity, right? Which means that, of course, the determinant of U and V are is either one or minus one, right? So you can think of this U and V as rotation matrices or they can also be mirrors, but basically th th you can think of this as, as, as a rotation matrix. So you do a rotation, and then D is a diagonal matrix, and diagonal matrices, of course, can be interpreted as just scalings in all dimensions. So this is always possible, right? You can always decompose a matrix into these three components. And then what you do is, to compute the uh, pseudo inverse, you simply take the um, pseudo inverse of every component, and the interesting thing is that the pseudo inverse of, a, of an orthogonal matrix is just its inverse, and you just have to do this, uh, just its, its transpose, right? Because, it's, because it's, it's, it's inverse, right? This is the definition of orthogonal. If you take its transpose, 
then the transpose is equal to the inverse, and an inverse is always also a pseudo inverse, right? That's that's the nice thing about it. The only thing we have to care about is the uh, d matrix, and to convert a d matrix into its um, pseudo inverse, what we have to do is we just take all the uh, values on the diagonal, all the others are zero. We take the values on the diagonal and take their reciprocal. We take just the one over it, right? So if we have a, a value x on that on that diagonal, we take one over x and we do this for all variables, for all non-zero elements of d. And this is the, the important part here. Very often there, there are zero values on that diagonal and then we have to do, uh, when, then we have to keep the zero values, right? We don't touch them, we only look at the non-zero values. And this is the way we get to this um, pseudo inverse. And now we can, of course, solve this problem. Now let's have a, a simple example how this looks like. Uh, this is just all taken from Bishop book. I don't have it here. Um, so here we have some uh, data source, right? The red sine curve is uh, a ground truth. So it's, it's a, an artificial example. So we just f say we assume we know the model. We sample some mo some data from that model with and add some noise to it, right? These green dots here are noisy examples from that sine curve. And now we try to find a model that fits into that. And if we do now polynomial regression, polynomial regression means that we use polynomials or monomials as basis functions, but we still do linear regression, right? It's still a linear regression thing. And this is uh, very important to note that, that linear regression simply means it is, it's called linear regression because you use um, linear, a linear mapping between parameters and, and features, right? So this wt times x, your model, is still a linear model, even though you have uh, non-linear um, basis functions, right? This is very important to, to note. Okay, now, um, what we do here in the first example, we, have, uh, we do regression, and if we constrain the model to be uh, complexity one, that means we only allow one, param one parameter in this model, then of course we can't fit anything very well in there because this is just a, a flat line, right? We, we only allow one parameter and um, the best fit into that data is of course the zero line because it explains best this data here. But now if we add more complexity to the, to the model, then the fit gets better, right? This is already uh, a polynomial of degree three or is it actually it's of degree two because we have three parameters, so that means we have the, the constant component and two other parameters. So the, the highest potential here, the highest basis function is x to the, to the two, x squared, right, with, with m equals three. So this is, this is just a parabola, or it tries to be a parabola that tr tries to be, uh, like should be fit into that data, and you can see it's not very nice, right? So it kind of explains some of the points, but it's like very bad. But as we go, adding more things, more complexity to the model, we see that our function fits much better to the, to the data, right? With five, we have already quite a good fit, right? It's not exactly the same as, as a sine curve, but of course it can't be that. I mean, we will not be able to fit perfectly a, a sine uh, using, um, using polynomials, but you see this works already quite nicely. The problem is, of course, you don't know where to stop, right? like which kind of complexity do you want? If you have a very high complexity, and in this case, if the complexity is equal to the number of data points, you see that every data point is perfectly fit, right? Every data point is explained by the, by the blue curve. But, of course, you don't want such a model because it's, it's very, very uh, hard to predict new things on that, right? If you want to say, if you want to learn or use that to, to learn from this green data, uh, and to be able to predict new things on the, on the uh, ground truth, on the uh, red curve, then you would not be able to do that. Because any, like if, you, if I sample randomly an another 11th point, then the prediction of the blue curve will be very bad compared to the ground truth, right? So this, this model does not predict well. It fits perfectly to the training data, but it doesn't fit well. It doesn't predict well. And, um, and we'll see later how, how we can... Um, uh, address this problem. So one idea we could do is, um, a simple idea is just do this here. So now let's, let's do more exp experiments, right? This is from, uh, from before, right? The same as before. Now, instead of adding more complexity to the model, we add more data points, right? So we have now 20 data points, we have 40 data points, and we have 100 data points. And there you see again, for this complexity 10, 
it's not a problem if we have like more data points. The more data points we have, the better it is for us because then our, our, our model, of course, fits better to the ground truth, which makes kind of sense because, because now we see more, we get more evidence about our model and now the fit should be much better uh, than before because we have much more data. Right? There's, there's this trade-off of complexity, model complexity, and, and data set size. Right? The more data we have, the better, of course. We always want as much data as we can get. Um, but this is not always possible. Right? This is not a, an easy solution to the problem because in most cases, there is not that much data. So that means if we are, stri are restricted with the data set, if we only have few data points, then we have to find other ways to avoid what we call overfitting, right? This was the overfitting problem here, or it's also, also in that slide. So here this curve completely overshoots, right? It, it over explains the data and it's not useful for prediction. So, um, and to avoid this, we need other ways, yeah, in case we don't have enough data. And um, yeah, let's, let's look at this problem and look at what could, could be the reasons for that. This is just a plot of the uh, parameters of our model uh, in, in size. So in these, these W values that we uh, fit into the data, um, they're just plot here, right, with numbers. Um, and they're plot for the different uh, complexities of the model. So here, this is complexity one. We have a very small value here. And as we increase complexity, we see that the size, the actual size of these um, parameters increases a lot. Right. In this case, where we have 10 parameters, we have this uh, ninth order polynomial. Right. The coefficients of that polynomial, which is the same as the weights that we fit into the, into the model, they are very, very high. These are very, very high numbers. Right. And they just go in both directions. This is just... Uh, so, this could be an indication that if this happens, this might be a way of detecting that we do overfitting, right? We don't want this here. And the idea now is to constrain this happening. So we constrain the parameter W to be of smaller values, right? Not, not to allow that, that high number uh, of values here. And we do this, do this not yet, we do this later. <laughs> Before we do uh, explain some other basis functions, um, yeah, so the, sorry, um, these, da these basis functions here are uh, just for completeness. We, we, uh, instead of having the polynomial, we can use um, Gaussian basis functions and sigma basis functions. Uh, these are explained also in more detail in the book. So here what we have is we have some, some um, points, mu, uh, j, and here as well, um, that, that are from, from the data space. We can say in, in this feature space, we take some uh, points and on these points, we evaluate the basis functions. So for every basis function, we have kind of a locality, right? We say this basis function is defined on that, on that location in the data set. The same is here. And we have then, again, if we do the linear uh, regression, then we have a sum of these data uh, basis functions weighted with the parameters W. Um, the way this looks like is then this here. So we have, now we see, um, again, our data, our green data. And the blue curve now, uh, is, is uh, the same thing as before, just with other basis functions, right? If you ha use Gaussian basis functions, then you s can see, uh, yeah, and we define the Gaussian basis functions to be on the locations of the data. That means this is our data point, and we define our Gaussian here. Then, kind of, is obvious that we have only one Gaussian, right? Only one basis functions, and this one Gaussian explains the data on that particular location, but it doesn't explain the data on the all the other. Uh, uh, locations. But as we add more uh, complexity to the model, right, we have this here with M3, M M5, and M10, uh, more data points are explained by that Gaussian. And again, as we have this before, we have almost a perfect um, explanation of the data with M equals 10, right? Um, yeah, and for the sigmoid basis functions, is this here. So it's basically the same here. We have a sigmoid function here, and as we add more thing, uh, complexity, we, we get better in the fit. It looks a bit better than the polynomial, but it still has the problem of overfitting, right? Now, these are the observations uh, that I mentioned already before. Uh, the first observation is the higher the, the model complexity grows, 
the better is the fit of the data, right? But we can't do that forever. We can't just increase the model complexity because if it's too high, then all data points are explained well, but the resulting model oscillates very much. This is called overfitting. So we cannot, the problem with overfitting is we cannot use that model for prediction. If you have a new test data set, it's very unlikely that this test data set will be explained well with our model, right? Because we overfit to the training data. Now, we can, of course, increase the size of the data set, just more samples. But if you can't do that, then we have um, a problem. Then we have to find other ways of um, um, avoiding this overfitting problem. OK, and we have this very important observation that the, the more complex models, they have larger parameters. And that's, that motivates the idea of constraining the size of the parameters. So now, instead of minimizing this error function, which is the same as before, right? this is just the squared error of our model to the data, now we add a second term to it, which is simply some lambda. This lambda just is a, a parameter that uh, weights between how, how much we trust or we want to minimize this and how much we want to minimize that. And this is the important part here. So here we have um, the, the, absolute, also the, the absolute value or the, uh, yeah, uh, um, of, of these parameters here. So we say, um, how large are these parameters? We just square them with itself and take uh, uh, the, uh, the squared here of this, of this uh, parameter. Um, that means we like to disallow large parameters here, right? If W is a vector with like very big numbers, then uh, this is bad for the whole equation. So the whole equation should be so that this um, value, this um, absolute value of this parameter here should be very small, right? So now we uh, minimize two things at the same time. Okay, and again, lambda, and we call this regularization, right? Regularization, yeah, because we kind of bound things, yeah? We want to regularize things, and, and lambda rules this influence of the realization. Um, and now the thing goes just again from scratch, so we do the same thing as before. We uh, uh, have our equations here, yeah? Now again, we write this as, as vectors here. We have uh, phi as a vector, phi as a vector here. Um, then we add uh, our lambda term here, and we again say this should be uh, zero. So again, this is the gradient, right? Uh, interesting here, uh, of course, um, this is the reason why we take one, one half of it, because the derivative of this is, is just um, lambda, w, uh, uh, lambda wt, right? This is just the derivative with respect to w of our squared term here. So now what, what comes out is we have the same as before, just with this little add-on here. We have this matrix now here, right? We have this phi t phi times something here, which can be written in matrix form like this, right? In the end, we have a matrix where we have a lambda on a diagonal, and we add to the diagonal elements of this matrix, we add just lambda values and invert that thing. Yeah? So this is the only thing that has changed. <coughs> All the other things um, are exactly the same as before. Um, now we have to find um, this lambda value, right? Um, and one way to do this is just look at the data and look at what happens if we do this uh, with different lambda values. So now n and m are the same as before. And you remember that for the first and the uh, slide before, we had a lot of overfitting with n equals 10 and m equals 10. Now with a very high value here in this regularization parameter, you can see that the blue curve is very smooth. It's very, um, yeah, smooth, yeah, you can say this. Um, but of course, we regularized too much, right? This lambda value is just too high because now our data is again not very well explained. But as we reduce lambda, we see that um, probably this is probably the best fit, right? This is already, I'd say, overfitting slightly. And this is again, this really overfits again very much because lambda is almost zero, so we have no regularization in here, right? So now we have this problem of finding good val good lambda values. Yeah. 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 So far, it's just another parameter. Yes, we have to um, cope with that at the moment, right? Yeah. Th 
The physical, well, hmm. I think the, um, the motivation is simply that we don't want to, we don't want lambda uh, w to grow too much. We just want to constrain uh, w in its in its size, right? Um, I think this this should be enough for the moment for the motivation part, right? We just say um, this this w here um, should be minimized along with the rest, right? This should be small and this should be small at the same time, because we had this observation that if w is very high, then we have overfitting and our our idea is that this is the cause for it, right? If we have very high, uh, long values here, uh, high values here, then this might be a, a good indication that we have overfitting. So to avoid overfitting, we try to constrain this um, in this way, right? Okay. Um, now, let's have a look at the same problem, the exactly same problem with a different kind of viewpoint, um, a bit more probabilistic viewpoint, and probabilistic viewpoints are always good, um, because this is uh, a major topic in this in this class, and we'll see later why th this is helpful. So we can say the same, we have the same data with the same problem, we would like to fit some function into that data, but now what, what our model is, is, is actually this here. So we have a model which again is uh, uh, a y function of some x and, and w, but now we add some epsilon here, and this epsilon is nothing else than a Gaussian with a zero mean and with a known covariance or variance, right? We say just, okay, this is something called noise. We just say our, our data is corrupted with noise and the noise term is just a sum into our model, right? This is now what we assume. Now we can write everything probabilistically. Now we can write nice formula like this one here. Now we have a probability of a, of a value t given a, a value x and a value w, and a value si sigma. Sigma is, we for now we assume that we know this, this is our model parameter, we know the, the noise variance, we know how, how, how strong the noise is. We, if, if we want to do prediction, this is our prediction here, then by that time we already have a good lambda va a w value, these are the parameters, and we have a new test data point, x, and now we want to find the probability of a new t, right? And we can write this as a, as a Gaussian, right? We just plug this in here, we say, this is the Gaussian that has this mean and this variance, right? This is exactly the same formulation as here, right? This whole thing can be written as a Gaussian or normal distribution. Okay, interpretation of this is this here. So this is our, our perfect model, y of x, x1 give, uh, and, and w, and around that perfect model we have some noise, noise term, and from that Gaussian distribution that is that goes around that data point, we have a sample, which is this one here, and this sample is our data. Okay, um, now let's say we want to find this W that maximizes our probability, right? So this is P, this is the likelihood of the measured data, right? This is how likely is it that we measure that, that what we actually observed. Now, what our problem formation is find parameters w that maximizes this probability of measuring the already measured data. So this is data that we already get, this is training data t and x, and now we would like to find w, this is unknown, this is known again, and this is always, you can always interpret this as, a, as a, something we call this as likelihood. Likelihoods are, in the general sense, you, uh, easy to understand like this, is something which is unknown is on the right side, and something which is known is on the left side. This is just a, a very rough explanation of what a likelihood is, but very often this, this just makes sense, right? This is just ex easily explained like that. So W is unknown, and everything else is known, and we'd like to maximize this, w, this, this P here. And we call this maximum likelihood estimation. Yeah. Um, for now here we say uh, sigma can also be estimated, but now we assume that sigma is known. We have this, this can be say, said we have a sensor, and we know the noise parameter of that sensor, and, and sigma is our sensor, uh, our sensor noise. Now, <coughs> let's do uh, this maximum likelihood estimation. Let's, let's have, we have all these data points here. We have um, the assumption that the points are drawn independently. That means we can now uh, split this probability up into uh, an, a number of probabilities. We can just um, multiply them, right? They are all independent, right? So that means we have just one big product. We again use our uh, uh, shortcut for the normal distribution here, the n. Um, and we write this in, in vector form, right? All the x and all the t are written as vectors here, right? This is our training data. x and t is the training data. 
Yeah. Now, instead of maximizing p, what we can also do is to make the things easier, we maximize the logarithm, right? Because here we have, we know that there's an exponential in that, in that n function, which is a bit tedious to use. So now what you can do is take, take the log logarithm uh, on both sides and maximize the logarithm of that, right? This is this here. So what this means is we take the logarithm, we uh, uh, plug in the uh, definition of the normal distribution. This is just this here. We can see here is our exponential. So this goes away then, and this is the we take the log of that, right? Log of that is log um, minus log of sigma squared minus log and 2 pi, which is this, per this uh, normalizer term here. Then we have uh, the, um, uh, the, the expo exponent here, which is this here. Um, what and what comes out, out in the end is something uh, that is constant for w. This term is completely independent of our parameters. And this term does contain the parameters. So if we want to minimize or maximize, sorry, if we want to maximize this likelihood, we don't have to care about this, par this part here at all because this doesn't change if we change w, right? So this can just go away. For, for maximization problems, we just neglect that part. And now interestingly is what happens here. Well, this is exactly the equation that we had before, right? This is just our squared error, right? So this means that we have another interpretation of the same problem, r just with more math and a bit more, like, funny, right? Makes makes more fun to write this down. Yeah. So we do the same thing, just with different ways of writing it. That means that maximizing the likelihood of this model here is the same as minimizing the sigma squared errors, right? Maximizing this here is, we have a, a minus sign here, is minimizing this error, right? Okay. Um, and now, of course, we know the solution already, right? We don't have to go, go on. We, we have the solution. We just put the pseudo inverse here, and that's it, right? That's, that's the solution of the problem. So the, the w that maximizes our likelihood is the w that minimizes our uh, squared error, which is exactly this, this thing here. Yeah? Again, this is written, the maximum likely solution is obtained using the pseudo-inverse. Now, um, we had the problem with uh, overfitting, and uh, in the uh, squared, if we minimize the squared um, error, then we saw that, that we can have overfitting. What we did there is we used uh, regularization. Now let's try to formulate also the regular regularization part in terms of probabilities. So now we what we can do is, uh, instead of uh, pr using parameters w that maximize the likelihood, we can assume something uh, about our parameters before we, we see any data, right? And this assumption of a model of parameters before seeing any data is called a prior, right? We just say, here, this is a probability distribution, it's, it's again a Gaussian, we say it's a Gaussian prior, and we do very simple um, assumption here. We just say this is um, a Gaussian, with zero mean and variance sigma two. It's another uh, this is another sigma here, which is not our noise, right? This is just, you can see this as a noise parameter for our parameters, not for the data, right? This is important to, to note. But um, this will help us then to explain this whole thing um, as before in regularization terms, right? So what this, what this only thing does is here is to say, before I see any data, I can already have some kind of notion of the model. Let's just say this should be a Gaussian distributed W. Now what we do is we just <coughs> apply Bayes' rule. I think we had this in the first lesson already. That means um, we have a posterior which is um, um, proportional to a likelihood times the prior. And proportional because uh, we have to normalize this, right? So the equal sign would be true if we divided that by the normalization. But we don't do that because we, we do um, maximization. So we want to maximize this whole thing. So it's, it's sufficient to just look at these two terms. Likelihood times prior is posterior. This is the main rule that you have to always know what this, what this is. Right? Likelihood, prior, posterior. Right? This you really have to keep in mind. This is the, the basic of, of most of the techniques that we'll have here. Right? Now, to do that, we plug this in here. So strictly speaking, of course, we have to normalize, but we, we maximize this whole thing, so we, we skip the normalizer. Now we do the same as before. We just uh, write this in log terms, right? Put the logarithm in front. Uh, there we have the same formulation as before, right? There's some constant term times what we had before. And this is the constant term minus this here. 
And again, we see here, right, because this is a Gaussian, the log of the Gaussian is again something like minus of uh, the squared of W, right? And what comes out is the same equation as before with regularization, just with this slight interesting thing is that lambda, if we set lambda to, be to uh, sigma 1 squared divided by sigma 2 squared, then we have exactly the same formulation as before, right? So this, I this shows us that maximum a posteriori estimation, MAP estimation as we call it, right? Is, e is the same as regularization, MAP is this, right? Because this is the posterior, and we maximize the posterior, that means we have an MAP uh, approach, maximize a posteriori estimation. And it's exactly the same as, as regularization. Now this summarizes the first lesson. Uh, regression is in general a method to find a mathematical model or function for a given data set. Um, regression can be done by minimizing the sum of squared errors, right? The distance of the data. However, that is a problem because we have this. This is called maximum likelihood estimation. Um, we can also explain ex express that in probabilistic terms, right? So this is the, the actually the, the probabilistic uh, interpretation of of this uh, sum of squared errors is maximum likelihood estimation. Uh, however, uh, we usually have overfitting problems there, and that's the reason why we uh, introduce um, regularization. And regularization is nothing else than looking at this problem from an, from an MAP uh, point of view, right? We do a maximum a posterior estimation, we assume a prior to, to our problem, and if everything is Gaussian, then we are happy because then we have everything in closed form, right? We have a prior a Gaussian, we have a likelihood Gaussian, and uh, the math tells, uh, tells us that we don't have to do any complicated stuff. What comes out is another Gaussian, and um, yeah, and we can, can solve for that. Yeah, this is... Um, for now, let's have a short break if there's no questions. Uh, have you seen R? Has anyone seen um, Is there uh, any kind of data set which doesn't follow the trend that the complexity, increasing complexity in the basis function uh, uh, not necessarily increases the overfitting of data? Complexity, any kind of model that you use, if you increase complexity, you always fit better to the data. That, that's a basic rule for everything. Th this is this kind of intuitive, right? The more complex your model, the better it fits to any kind of data you give it. But you don't want that. You, there's a constraint. You don't want to have an over-complex model. There's this Occam's razor uh, sentence, right? That says, be as simple as possible. Use the most simple model that, you, that still explains the data well. Because otherwise, this is... This is um, the whole point of, of learning, because otherwise, otherwise you just use the data itself as a model, right? If you if you don't constrain complexity, you say, hey, I just take all the data, and this explains me already everything. But of course, it only explains itself; it doesn't explain new data. More questions? Okay, have a break. Okay, um, let's go on. <coughs> so, um, in the second um, hour today, I would like to talk about Bayesian linear regression, which is basically the same as we had before, just with a slight difference that now we have, um, we assume that we have sequential data. That means um, we don't observe all the data points at once, um, but instead we get a data point and another data point and another data point, and in every time step when we get these new data points, We'd like to be able to update our model accordingly, right? So we have again our same uh, model here, but now with new data, we'd like to find, um, get this model more um, more accurate, right? Um, and this is called Bayesian linear regression because we do we apply Bayes rule very often, right? We do Bayesian estimation, and um, it's basically an online learning um, problem. And these problems are very interesting, right? Online learning problems are particularly interesting. Um, and so we'd like to uh, answer two questions. First of all, what happens in this case of sequential data, which I said already. So we have data come dropping in instead of having one big data set. Um, and um, the other thing is, uh, how can we compute the so-called predictive distribution? This is the predictive distribution. So we have all the training, T and X. We have a new test point X here, right? This is. Um, usually, what I could do is I could um, 
could have noted this as a star or asterisk, right? You say X star is the, the test data set, and T star would then be the uh, probability of observing that new um, output, right? Whatever it might be. Um, for now, there's no stars, but I think you understand what this means. So this is the old data, right? This is the old targets. This is the what comes from a training data set. This is the new data, and this is the new target, which is the probability of that new target given the old data. Before we uh, start with this, we need some kind of formulations, and these are equations that are quite important for also for many other things, right? Not only for this class today, um, because it turns out that Gaussians are, or normal distributions in general, or Gaussians, they are very good um, for many, many reasons. And one reason is that all these equations here, uh, they are very easily computed with Gaussians. It looks a bit of a lot of math here. But uh, the important part of this is there's always n's. Right? There's an n here, there's an n here, there's an n here, there's an n here. Yeah? So what does this mean? So first of all, let's assume we have, we're given these, these two things. Right? We have uh, a prior, which is a probability that depends on nothing. Just the probability of some x and no dependence right, whatsoever. We just assume we have this prior thing. This is usually called the likelihood. <coughs> this is a general form of likelihood. Right? We have something here which we know and something we don't know but we assume that the probability distribution that is underlying of that model is again a gaussian if this is another gaussian and now now the important part comes and if that gaussian if the if the mean value of that gaussian is a linear combination of things from that thing here so if there's an, some a matrix times x plus b right if this is uh true then we can say and if we solve these uh, things by using Bayes' rule, right? We now um, put up a Bayes' rule and then um, get uh, the equations for these um, um, Gaussians. Then it turns out that first of all, the prior of y is another Gaussian, and it has this mean value and this covariance matrix. Right? These are all matrices now. Um, and this here is more important: is the posterior. Right? This is the posterior of our parameter x, given our data y, and it can again be written as a, as a Gaussian distribution. And here we have a very long expression for the, for the mean value. Right? This is a very long thing. And sigma is our covariance matrix, and sigma here can be written like this here. This is, I'm sorry for that, this is, should be a 2 and there's an s. And also this y is actually, pr actually wrong. So on the uh, slides, if I put the slides online, then this will be corrected. This, this y is not, not true. This y should be a mu, right? This should be going here, right? But the details are, for a moment, not so important. Important is just to say, to know that if we do Bayesian reasoning with Gaussians, then things are very easy because we have all in closed form, right? This thing is what we, this is our friend. Right? This is what we have to look at, right? So we're given something, and we want to do the posterior. And that's what we're going, going to do now. Right? So we have this little algorithm here. So we have some prior mean, some covariance s, and some, some noise covariance. And so we assume that our, our prior on the, on the um, parameters w is a Gaussian distribution with m0 and s0. Now <coughs> we have um, our index running here, started with 0. We observe the new data point x i t i. Now from that new data point, what we do is we formulate the likelihood, right, as a function of w. We say this is the likelihood of the data given our parameter w, which is again is a Gaussian with mean, with this mean here and the covariance sigma, right? This we had already, right? This is our Gaussian that we had in the previous uh, lesson. So that means this thing here, right, is, we see this already, a, li a, a linear dependency between the w parameter of this prior. So this is called a, li a linear Gaussian model, right? Because this thing depends linearly on something which has a Gaussian prior. Right? So, and we have some covariance, and again we assume that we know the covariance, but interestingly now is that because we have this linear Gaussian model, we can compute now the posterior, we multiply the likelihood with the prior, and we get the posterior, right? We normalize it, of course, um, and this again is a Gaussian. And this Gaussian has another mean, uh, mean vector and a covariance matrix, but these can be computed, right? These, these are easily computed. And again, the, the nice trick about this is that this posterior serves as a new prior for the next round. 
right? Now we say, I forget everything I have seen before. I have already now a good model of my current <coughs> state, of my current uh, parameter set, right? I know now parameters, given all my previous data, are Gaussian with this mu and with this sigma. Now I don't have to take all the previous data points again in into account. Now I, t I look at this as a new prior into the next round, and I serve the next data point and do the same thing again, and over and over and over again. And this looks a lot like what we had last week, where we had this very long base filter equation. So I think I, I showed you that already. Um, don't look at this too, too close. I mean, the um, notations here are completely different, right? This is from last week, right? Th this is might uh, confuse you. I, I, this x is different x, and uh, that, t that is different z. So we don't have these, these symbols here anymore. But what this shows you is just it's exactly the standard base filter thing, right? We have a base equation here, we have a likelihood, we have a prior, and we divide this by some normalizer, and we get a posterior. This is, this is what all is, this is all about. So now let's do a simple example. We would like to fit a straight line into a set of data points. I think we had this already, just fitting a line into data points. Assume we have, this is a basis function, so we have again ident identity, we don't do polynomial fitting, we just have constant uh, basis functions here. Um, Oh, uh, yeah, x or yeah. Then our prior mean is zero, and pr our prior covariance is something like this, right? We have we just know we know these things, and we have some noise variance sigma one, which is zero point two to the square. Now we have some ground truth, right? We uh, uh, for the moment we, we we assume we know the model. We'd like to know know how how well does our algorithm fit to that model, right? So we have this model here with a line, and we give it these two numbers, and now we'd like to find we like to estimate these model parameters, and then the good thing with, uh, with the ground truth is we can then see how close are we to the actual ground truth, right? So what we do now is we want to recover uh, A0 and A1 from the sequential incoming data points. So that means we have now data points, two-dimensional di two data points coming in, and we do a sequential estimation on that. This is exactly the same e example as in the book, and uh, for everything else, if there's any more details on that, this is quite well explained in the book. So if there's any questions on that later on, just have a look in the book. I think this, this is very nicely done. Also in the other book, interestingly, in the Murphy, uh, they take the same example from that book. So this is a good indication that's a good example. Um, so what does this mean? So we have, now we have everything like plotted, right? Plotting is much more easier to understand than math very often, but we need both. So so this is just a prior. This is just a prior distribution over values w1 and w0, right? So we assu assume that our data is not uniformly distributed, but we have some parameters. The, the most likely parameter is somewhere here. Um, what we can also do, we can now sample from that, right? We can now sample parameters, and every parameter gives us a model, and we can plot the model, which is lines. And these lines here um, are taken from, from this... Um, from this prior, right? So you can see that, uh, yeah, it's probably, in the, in the other book, there's a better example here. This is not really convincing, actually. Um, so what you should be able to see is that um, the, uh, the low values, like low um, distance from the um, origin, low W01 and low uh, W1, were, are preferred, right? This, this should be lines that don't have a high slope, and they're not very far from the from the center. There are some lines with a high slope here, which is a bit, well, uh, counterintuitive. But it's it's in general this should be what 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 comes out here, right? If you sample from that, you prefer lines that are not very steep. Okay, now let's look at our likelihood. Likelihood is this here, and um, now the question comes up: Is this a Gaussian? Well, it's not really a Gaussian because you plot this for all kinds of values w, right? Um, I um, if I should go back, where is it? So what we do is we have this likelihood here, and now we plot this is a Gaussian. But if we plot this for all kinds of w values for w zero, w one, then for every one, for every given w, this is a different Gaussian, right? This is the reason why it doesn't look like a Gaussian here. Right. But again, I mean, this is just for visualization for you, right? To understand that this is the likelihood 
of the new data point, right, given our parameters. This is like how that's the reason. Well, how likely is our w values, right, after we have observed a first data point? And um, interestingly, is inter interesting to see is that um, the, 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 the preference now is on lines that actually fit to that data point. So this is our new data point that we have observed, right? This is data space. And now, if we sample from that uh, posterior that we get now here, right? This is, this is actually the posterior of the first round, which is the prior of the next round. This is the reason why it's called prior here. Uh, this is again a Gaussian, right? We have now a Gaussian distribution on Ws. By simply multiplying the prior with the, with the likelihood, we get another Gaussian here. And if we sample from that Gaussian, we get least lines. Right, and we see that the preference of lines is that lines that go through that point. And now we observe more data points. So this is ground truth again. For, for example, uh, this is just this this little white cross here is uh, the ground truth. We know we know that the model has these values, right? We just want to observe now how how well does it fit to that model. And now we observe more data, and um, you see first of all th this is the likelihood, which lo looks very similar to the one before. But this, lo this likelihood only looks at the last point, right? This, this wouldn't change much in shape. It just uh, changes a bit in, in orientation. But this likelihood simply, simply uh, shows what is um, the likelihood of the last point given our current parameters. <coughs> now, if you again multiply that with our pr uh, posterior from before, we get a new posterior, which again is a new prior for the next round. And this prior you can see is uh, already much more condensed, right? We have a much smaller and more accurate with a, with a lower variance, a, a Gaussian with a lower variance. And now if we sample from that prior, then we get lines that are, that prefer to go into the vicinity of these da two data points, right? And the more we do that, if we sample now 20 points, then we see uh, the lines that we sample from that model here, they all fit very, or oh, mostly of them are very close to the data. And our prior is now also very close to the, tr to the ground truth. Right? So the more data we see, the more accurate we get. And, um, yeah, and um, the more, if you sample from that, the better we are to the, to the actual true model. This is called the half space. Right? Half space uh, means because we have a half transform. And um, half transform just means for every line, Every line is a point in the space, and uh, so in this case, every, every point is a line here, and every line is a point, so this is just the, the mapping from one uh, to the other. Yeah, um, this is the predictive distribution. Uh, this is something we had um, also, the qu this was one of the questions that we had before, right? So let me go back. Um, yeah, so we wanted to uh, not only answer this here, but also like uh, answer this thing here. We'd like to know how, what is the pr uh, probability distribution of t given uh, my training data and my new test point. And um, again, this is so important to know. This is not a value, right? It's not just one value. This is a whole distribution over t's, right? And this dis distribution, in our case, turns out to be a Gaussian. And to compute that distribution, what we do is let me see this. We um, we take this integral here. So we integrate over all um, parameters of the model. Um, and what we do here again is our likelihood and our prior. Right. This is the prior, the last prior that we got from the training data, right? Which is now a posterior, of course, because now we have obs observed everything. We have seen all x and all t. Now we have a good, quite good model of how likely is our w. Now the only thing we have to now uh, do is multiply this again with a likelihood and integrate out all these w things. In a sense, you can see this is basically our normalizer, right? This is in the base rule. This is what what's, uh, it's what's on the uh, uh, denominator, right? Um, but now the good thing is that again, this is all Gaussians, and this is another operation that works very nicely on Gaussians. Because um, this is, yeah, this is what comes out is another Gaussian, right? This, this is just the, uh, the short version of that. What this means is that we can now express 
So if we express this here with this Gaussian here, then we have uh, these are the formulations as, as before. Um, so we have a new. Uh, this is our our posterior here, right? And this is just plugging in our um, equations and before into our our model here. So we can now compute the covariance matrix and, and the mean. Let me go this to this again. Prior prior mean, and yeah. Now we use our formula from above. That means that. Now we have um, um, we plug in these Gaussians here, right? We have this one is, is the likelihood. This is the uh, posterior or the pri uh, current prior now, and to get this predictive distribution, we just have to uh, integrate this. And as I said already, this can be done in closed form. And the uh, result of this is that we have another mu value here, another sigma value here, and sigma can be computed like this here, right? Ah, yeah, that's right. So, um, yeah, so that's the nice thing about this, right? Now, to predict new things here, we just have to um, ask the Gaussian and say, how likely is the new data point uh, after we have seen all this data? Now, um, let's have nice another example. This is, um, again, our sinusoidal uh, data, right? We have our ground truth as a sine, sine function. Uh, we have nine uh, Gaussian basis functions, and we have one data point. So that means um, our predictive distribution, this is uh, quite interesting. Now we can compute, of course, the predictive distribution for, for every new data point. So what we do now is we go through this x here, and for every x, we can compute now a mu and a sigma, right? The mu is the red line, and the sigma is this reddish area, right? And that's very interesting because now we can have a notion of uncertainty. We know around the data that we get, we are much, much more certain because we have a much lower variance here. Our Gaussian that is centered at this position here has a much lower variance. But all the other Gaussians, if we, if we want to predict a data point here, then we would have a most likely value, which is here, but our uncertainty is very, very high. So we don't know exactly what this actually means. We, it could be anywhere in, in this big area here, which uh, is just bad because it's, this is like a, a very uncertain prediction. But of course, we only have one data point. So how can we predict something from only one data point? Um, and this right part here shows um, some samples from this posterior. So if you only use this one data point to compute a posterior distribution, and we try to sample from that posterior distribution. That means we can now sample functions from it, right? We, every uh, sample we get from this is a parameter set, and every parameter set defines a function, and the function can be plot. So this is what we do here, right? So we plot functions. Um, and it's actually also a very nice concept already, right? We have now the concept not, not only sampling points, you can now sample functions, right? This is quite interesting, because we'll have this later also in, in, in other contexts. Yeah. And we see that the functions that we plot here, right, they all kind of agree on the fact that there should be this data point here. So they all go through that data point, but other than that, they kind of disagree a lot, right? There, there's a lot of going stuff going on here and on, on, on here, so we can't really say that we have a good measure or way of sampling from that posterior. Now we observe the next data point, and now we see already something happening here. So now we see the, uh, the uh, variance uh, just goes down uh, along, this, along this line. And we have another uh, observation here that our red line has already a bit better shape, which is like closer to the, to the ground truth, to the sign shape of the ground truth, right? Because now we have obse observed more things, more data, and now our certainty is higher. Now we can say, yeah, so in between these data, two data points, I can now tell with more confidence that uh, if I predict things here, then they are more very likely to be in that in that margin, right? Um, away from the data, again, we don't have a good estimate, right? There, we just don't know what how how likely we are. And again, if you do the same now with sampling, if you sample from that from that posterior, we get um, these functions here, and these try to again fit to these two data points, but away from the data, they are quite bad, they're quite different. And this is done now with four data points. You see now there's a much much better fit. Yeah, of course. Uh, also, this also shows us that um, 
if we, it also depends where we sample these data points, right? So if we want a good prediction on a, on a large space, then we should sample these training data points very broadly, right? Um, and we see this because this data point here is on, on, one, on the left side, this is on the right side, and of course these now constrain our, cons our uncertainty uh, on the borders, right? If we, if we went on observing things only between these data, data points, then we will have a very good prediction only locally, but far from the data, we will don't, don't have a good prediction. So it, it makes sense to, to, sh to use data that is like well nicely distributed around our feature space, our, our, our training space, right? So if this is our training space here, we want to have data that is um, nicely distributed, and, um, and that's the trade-off. We want to have not much data. The, the, the less data we need, the better. But if we are constrained with few data points, then we'd like to prefer the data points being distributed um, far away so that we can have a better prediction between the data points. Yeah, and now again, we sample from that. This is this here. So we sample data po uh, uh, functions from that. And, and the functions you see, they, they, they pass through these data points. Um, and in between the data points, there's still a lot of uncertainty. And now this is, I think, after 25 data points. Yeah, now we can see already this is a quite, quite nice fit, right? Right. Our predictive di distribution has has become very condensed, very um, very certain. Right. Our s uh, uncertainty band around the uh, most likely estimation, the, the red curve, uh, has become very narrow. Right. So we are very very close to the red red line, which means that we have a very high certainty. If we now predict things, then we have good uh, good error bounds here. And again, if we sample from that posterior, then we have um, then we have this this situation here. Yeah, uh, we we'll come already to this <laughs> to the summary. So this second hour is a bit shorter than before. Um, now, in general, uh, regression is an exp uh, can be exp expressed as a least squares problem. I said this already before. We uh, also said we talked about uh, overfitting. Right, um, I think this is kind of a summary of a summary, but well, it's, it helps you a bit, I think. Um, then we have this maximum likelihood estimation uh, uh, shown before. Um, and now the new thing, what we had in the last uh, uh, hour was, um, was this Bayesian linear regression. So this is uh, a very interesting and important topic because it, it operates on sequential data. Right, Very often we have sequential data. Um, even if we don't have sequential data and we have an algorithm that works in sequential data, then this helps us a lot because then we don't have to constrain our algorithm to have to, to use large data sets, right? We can then say we have an algorithm that works in a small data set, um, and uh, in every so it already gives us uh, a good estimate of what we have. So you can li look at this as, as like a, an, an anytime algorithm, right? So you, instead of looking at all the data, if, you, if it's too much, then you just look at a part of it. And you already have already have a good estimate of that. And as you get more information into the model, you get more and more uh, accurate and more more certain. So this is this is a very nice uh, technique here. And uh, most importantly, uh, when we use Gaussians, if you assume everything is normal normal distributed, then um, then things are very easy, right? And we'll see examples where this is not true, right? This is this is an example and it holds in many cases, but particularly it holds only when we have a lot of data, right? This is this, this law of, of big numbers. But uh, of course, there might be situations where we don't have Gaussians. For now, we just say everything is Gaussian. We're happy with Gaussian noise, we have Gaussian priors, and then everything is easily computed analytically by, by using closed form solutions. This ends the lesson of the day. Uh, now we can have some questions, yeah? Yes. Sure. Next. Yes. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yes. So no, no, no. So um, no. Uh, the basis function. Hmm. The basis function parameters. Uh, for now, you say you, you know them, right? So this is 
what, what you estimate is just the coefficient in front of that basis function, the w. The basis function itself has parameters, um, but they don't matter so much. So in this case, what you simply do is you take a Gaussian around that certain data point with the, with the given covariance matrix. You just say this uh, sigma and this mu, you just know it. Or, or you know the, the mu because it's, it's the data point itself, and the sigma of that Gaussian is just a given number, right? Uh, yeah, but it's it's a good point. I mean, if we actually what you actually could do is now also optimize for these parameters, right? Now I have another optimization technique and minimize your error or um, maximize posterior uh, with respect to these parameters too. That's right. Yeah. Well, you you don't check. Well, y the, the assumption is that your model has a set of parameters. And this doesn't change over time, right? So uh, if you observe more things, then this W shouldn't change. It, you just get a, a better estimate of it. More questions? OK, yeah. Um, well, what you could do is you have could have a validation set. You could then say, uh, let's let's take one part where we just train on one training data set, and take another data set which I know the ground truth of, but I don't use that for training. And then I show that training data that, that validation set to the model, and then have uh, analyze the model how well it works. And yeah, and that could be a stopping criterion. You could say, yeah, now I predict reasonably well on that validation set and I stopped and now. Yeah. But this is this is definitely a problem because again you need more data for that, right? That's right. More questions? Um something also on the organization part. So there will be um exercise classes. Not today, I think. Well I don't know. Well yes, yes, sorry, sorry, I'm saying this wrong. Um there will be uh an exercise class today, but it will be a short one because there's no um uh exercise sheets yet. So um We'll hand out the first uh, sheet today. I'll have to talk to, uh, with um, with Jan, and then the idea is that th by next week, yeah, you uh, do the, the tasks, and then next week will be um, a larger uh, session on 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 this exercise. Uh, the um, question was, I think I said this already, uh, if we can switch the date of that, if it shouldn't be Friday or something else. So um, I have to. First, also t t talk back to um, to Jan, or it might be someone else who does that yet. This is still under discussion. Um, but um, I think we'll send out an email for every one of you uh, that um, helps. Th and there will be a doodle, and you can then say, I would like to have the uh, date at that time, at that hour. And then um, we do that. And the reason we, call it we have it on Friday is because we just copied everything from last um, semester, which is always the easy thing to do, but it's, of course, not. Uh, very helpful. Uh, the, the experience shows that um, Friday is not a good time for, <laughs> for doing exercise classes. So if you have another time, then it would be good for us too. Right? I mean, I, I'm happy with that. Yeah, sorry for being a bit short today, but I think it will be next time. I think I, I was faster. I was uh, faster than last semester. <laughs> yes. Yeah, so, so the slides will be online, right? Um, no, this, th yes, also for the first one, for this one, everything will be online. The uh, recording is on demand. If you want to have it, um, I might set up a, so we have this Redmine server where you can have uh, an account. This is one idea. I don't know how to do this in the end. And then you can download it. So you need an account and you ask me for an account, I give you one. So that not everyone can just download it, right? So I don't know if this, I think it should be okay for you guys. Okay. Yeah. Yes. Yes. That's. More questions? Thanks.